Okay, welcome back. So, I would be now giving you an overview of uh, advanced machining processes and uh, this is about how you make uh, the micro uh, structured systems or micro systems. So, let us just uh, briefly review what we did in the last lecture. So, we had a historical perspective of micro systems. We went into some concepts uh, and the way that uh, the miniaturization drive had emerged starting from the very famous lecture of Sir Richard Feynman in 1959. We talked about Moore's law and the integration density and how Moore's law is increasingly changing from doubling in 18 months to doubling in about 24 months. We also uh, talked at length about physical and biological MEMS and discussed some very interesting examples of physical and biological uh, MEMS systems. So, the take home message for this particular lecture was really that it is a synergistic learning experience with uh, the biological world. So, there are a lot of inspirational uh, material available from the biological world that can be translated uh, to make uh, micro structured systems, nano systems. And so, therefore, uh, a vast majority of fabrication processes are really bio inspired as well. So, we will uh, do this in details while looking into a hisper historical perspective of how parallelly machining or uh, microstructuring evolved over time. So, let us uh, get a historical uh, perspective of some of these processes uh, which are known as uh, manufacturing processes. So, uh, we have already in our uh, uh, engineering lectures uh, prior to this seen that a lot of parts can be manufactured by some of these basic processes like casting, forming and various uh, shaping processes. Uh, and therefore, uh, all these processes making parts really require further finishing before they are ready uh, to be used in an assembled form. And uh, these sort of high throughput processes are uh, further required to be fine processed, uh, so that whatever requirements of tolerances are dictated by engineering assemblies of such parts uh, can be realized. And so, this is really one of the reasons why initially advanced manufacturing processes were developed, so that uh, the tolerances up to the size of uh, microns or even nowadays increasingly to nanometers can be easily provided by uh, the, the advancement of the process itself. Sometimes also in many engineering applications, interchangeability of a part is a major issue, which uh, needs these uh, specific dimensional accuracy and surface finish. So, this again dictated the need for these advanced manufacturing processes. So, let us look at uh, one of these processes machining which involves uh, the removal of some material from a work piece in order to produce a specific geometry <coughs> and that too at a, a certain degree of accuracy and surface quality. So, uh, with a machining uh, into picture, uh, one can really uh, look into the history of machining uh, or where this concept of shaping objects uh, started. Uh, so, one of the first examples in the mankind of uh, uh, sort of machining comes from this most ancient paleolithic uh, stone tool industry, the old one. Okay. It was developed about 2.6 million years ago uh, by members of the <coughs> genus called Homo uh, habilis or Homo sapiens and they were really uh, tools shaped out of stones as choppers, burins and alls as uh, some examples can be seen here. Okay. So, man really learned to remove material in a desirable manner as uh, far back as the Paleolithic age. Uh, further developments happened and uh, uh, the invention of nets or bolas where this uh, big rock in a carved in a spherical manner. Uh, would be tied up on a rope and thrown onto 
animals to, to make hunting uh, possible or even spears uh, which would be something like what you saw here tied at the end of a, a big stick uh, or bow and arrows uh, developed. Okay. So, interestingly machining uh, dates as far back as this period okay. and uh, slowly things changed and we went into the copper edge where uh, still handheld tools uh, had a lot of prominence uh, in the copper as well as the bronze age which was about 1 million years back. So, some example problems are illustrated again here this was a ceremonial giant dirk of uh, found in France in the year 1500 and belongs to a year 1500 to 1300 BC. This was some bronze age weaponry and ornaments which were developed by people who learnt some of the basic manufacturing processes by this time and uh, still everything was uh, really manual or hand held. So, almost uh, up to 17th century all the tools uh, which uh, men used for developing some of these fine objects were hand operated and uh, the methods were very, very elementary up till uh, a little bit later uh, of course, uh, you know uh, man humankind found out that uh, the power of water or steam could be very easily used and of course, much later it was realized that electricity could be again another very useful source of delivering energy. So, that uh, you could power drive some of the tools uh, for creating different shapes onto metals. Uh, and so, if you look at one of the first illustrations, it comes from this John Wilkinson in 19 in, in 1774, who first constructed a precision machine for boring engine cylinders and it was powered by steam. So, this is one of the uh, earliest examples of how machining uh, uh, could actually take place uh, and increasingly go into the powered domain from the manual domain. So, this followed uh, a lot of other illustrations later on for example, 23 years later Henry Maudslay actually developed this uh, screw cutting lathe as uh, uh, is illustrated in uh, uh, this particular example here okay. and uh, then of course, James Nasmith invented the second basic machining tool for shaping and planing uh, which is again illustrated in this particular figure here okay. and then the first universal mining machine was uh, built uh, by J R Brown uh, in uh, the year 1862 and these were all power tools. Uh, starting with John Wilkinson's uh, first engine boring system, which uh, used the steam uh, uh, for providing the power. So, after uh, these basic machining tools were developed to uh, have high throughput processes or highly productive processes, people realized that finishing was a very important aspect. And so, in the late uh, 19th century, uh, the grinding machine was introduced for the first time and uh, uh, as a more advanced form this process later on uh, changed to lapping and high quality surface finishes with very tight tolerances could be easily realized using a combination of grinding and lapping processes on uh, the primary machining operations which were done by these powered systems as we illustrated before. So, if we <coughs> look into a little more of history in the later part of these 19th and 20th centuries machine tools uh, uh, first became increasingly electrically powered okay. and uh, they had uh, many refinements. Uh, for example, people uh, shifted from single cutters to multiple point cutters uh, and uh, milling tool was introduced for the first time based on this concept. The whole machining paradigm uh, although it was powered was still dependent on operators and human skill who by their own judgment would look at parts and uh, use his, his or her skills to completely uh, provide uh, the sequence of operations and therefore, the workpiece accuracy would typically depend on the operator. So, 
as a as an increasing need for precision was felt rapidly in the industry particularly because of complex systems like automotives etc which emerged uh, uh, on a commercial scale during this time uh, for the first time in 1953 uh, the introduction to numerical control systems uh, where a computers power would be used with a numeric logic for uh, uh, obtaining uh, a good precision and repeatability of relative motion between a tool and a workpiece was felt. And so, with all these capabilities integrated together, the present capability of these tooling systems uh, have really enormously increased up to the level of uh, initially it was about a micron, but then with the current technologies of uh, chemical, photochemical and you know some high energy beam based machining, it can go to the size range of a few atoms. So, it is about probably tens of nanometers that this limit has been pushed to increasingly. And not only that, it can, uh, it has tremendous capabilities uh, of uh, producing complex shapes with the kind of finishing accuracies, uh, uh, which can be as low as uh, let us say a micron level finish. So, increasingly the power of uh, machining industry has grown over uh, the various decades uh, and up till now uh, you know this power can be really manipulated and maneuvered to even place a few atoms and molecules and so that is what the accuracy level has slowly gone into. So, in modern uh, machining practices of course, uh, uh, one uh, important aspect is to be able to remove material which is harder, stronger and tougher and it is more difficult to cut and uh, that is one of the goals of some of these modern machining practices and it should be independent of. Uh, so, the cutting processes should really be independent of material properties of the of the work piece and as such uh, uh, increasingly from this so called conventional domain of metal to metal cutting uh, increasingly the focus has changed into some of these non conventional machining practices, which has uh, become very very handy as an alternative particularly if you have to realize complex uh, shapes with a certain amount of surface integrity and most important aspect miniaturization or micro micron size uh, requirements of the components. So, in this course typically we would be more focused on to this non conventional machining domain and the way that it would be used for uh, creating some of or achieving some of these targets as machining complex shapes or going very very small teeny tiny components how that can be manufactured would we'll be probably going through some material based on that. Okay. Of course, uh, needless to mention is this concept of hybrid machining which uh, combines the enhanced advantages of uh, more than two processes, okay, two or more than two processes, so that your objective of super high finish and high productivity, or maybe super high finish and uh, complex shape, uh, both can be achieved together. So, because of all these domains which are now increasingly available in machining science, uh, micro machining has uh, emerged. Uh, into into a domain where uh, really very small up to about 1 micron or so feature sizes can be realized very easily combining some of these technologies as hybrid machining technologies. So, recent applications of micro machining could include uh, silicon and glass micro machining, uh, uh, excimer laser based machining, photolithography and these are some of the most modern processes of non conventional machining which uh, is used this particular domain. Okay, so, <coughs> machining uh, has increasingly also uh, come up from you know precision grinders where an accuracy of about plus minus 1 microns uh, can be measured using uh, some non contact mediated measurement processes like interferometry or laser based uh, instruments. 
and uh, uh, the, the future trends in micro machining really includes uh, the power of beams of either photons or particles and uh, processes like electron beam lithography or uh, uh, focused ion beam uh, is increasingly being used to realize uh, or micro manipulate uh, materials even down to the atomic level uh, in a very precise manner. So, uh, these combined with a few other uh, processes uh, also are classified into the area of nano machining as a very recent trend and these processes uh, are capable of in, uh, you know uh, manipulation at the atomic and the molecular level and uh, the nano machining concept really was first introduced by Taniguchi uh, and it covered miniaturization of components uh, and tolerances in the range of sub micron level. Uh, and also to the level of hundreds of nanometers or even as low as 0.1 nanometers uh, in the various domains that was proposed by Taniguchi in his model for nano machining. So, let us look at uh, some of uh, <coughs> the machining accuracies with respect to the number of years as can be illustrated here in figure 1.1 and uh, as you can see uh, these uh, different domains of uh, machining like for example, turning and milling machines, uh, grinding CNC machining centers, uh, lapping, honing, jig boring and grinding so on so forth. So, these are the different equipments and machine tool classes uh, which are uh, grouped together in order of how much machining accuracies they can produce. And if you look at uh, the way that this machining has involved or, or is evolved from as far back as 1940 to uh, you know the late 2000, you can see that the machining accuracy really has changed quite a bit from about let us say um, 0.1 inches to uh, hundreds of microns to about close to uh, uh, as, as low as about 1 micron, uh, particularly if you uh, were to take into account these three conventional domain processes turning, milling, grinding, CNC milling centers, lapping, honing, jig boring and grinding so on so forth. So, this also is the normal machining domain uh, and so you can achieve up to a machining accuracy of 1 microns uh, by the year 2000 as you can see here and uh, this has really been achieved uh, as, as indicated in this particular chart. Some of the other uh, processes like precision grinding, super finishing, diamond grinding and turning, high precision mask aligners, ultra precision diamond turnings, they come in the domain of precision machining okay. and uh, here uh, the machining accuracy really starts from about 1 micron and goes down further to almost about hundreds of nanometers about 0 0.01 microns and that could be roughly about 10 to the power of minus sixth of an inch. If you go uh, a little further down here, the, the electron beam soft x-ray lithography, ion beam machining, molecular beam epitaxy, ion implantation and we will understand some of the basic machining principles and processes as we move along. They can be classed into this ultra precision machining domain where uh, the machining accuracy is as low as uh, hundreds of uh, nanometers of 0.1 microns is the starting line and it goes all the way to about 0 0.001 microns which is about 1 nanometer which is that of uh, even atomic uh, manipulation you know at the level of lattice separation etcetera. So, you can see that with increasing uh, time varying from 1940 to 2000 uh, the machining paradigm classified normally as a normal domain, precision domain and ultra precision domain have gone from all the way from about hundreds of microns to as low as about 1 nanometer which is that of simple lattice spacing between the atoms. So, such is the power of machining technology and its emergence over the number of years. So, let us actually now look at a, a broad classification of all the machining or the material removal processes and here I would like to classify the, the processes as a traditional domain and then the non-traditional or non-conventional domain and of course, this would be our area of interest 
for this particular course, although a brief mention would be made uh, of the traditional domain processes. So, in the traditional machining uh, area, if you look at the class uh, and the subclasses of these machining, you have uh, uh, a category of cutting processes, where uh, these different uh, you know processes can be classed as turning, boring, drilling. These are all cutting processes and this would be able to generate uh, circular shapes. And then some other shapes can also be generated by these other set of cutting processes or metal cutting mechanisms like uh, milling, planing, shaping, broaching, uh, sawing, filing, gear forming, gear generating, so on and so forth. So, traditional machining uh, has this one class or one domain where you are actually having a metal to metal cutting. And then there is another domain which is used for finish machining operations on this cut pieces, which is mechanical abrasion based. And then uh, it can be based on bonded abrasive abrasives like you often find in grinding or honing or coated abrasives technology or loose abrasives that you often find in polishing or buffing, right, where uh, the slurry really contains the abrasive and then the polisher or the tool is really rubbing the slurry against the workpiece surface. So, therefore, uh, that is how traditional machining domain can be classed and of course, needless to say is that this is a high throughput low accuracy process and the mechanical abrasion is actually a, a relatively lower uh, yield, but high accuracy process as far as the traditional machining domain is concerned. So, we have already made a case before uh, to illustrate that these traditional domain processes may not be that useful when uh, you come uh, to realize or machine increasingly uh, tougher or high strength materials with complex shapes. and precision or accuracy up to the level of uh, even atomic manipulation. And so, therefore, these set of machining parameters called the non-traditional machining uh, techniques come into picture. And uh, <coughs> they typically include chemical machining, electrochemical machining, electrochemical grinding, uh, electro discharge machining, laser beam machining, abrasive jet machining, water jet machining plasma beam machining and ultrasonic machining. So, these are some of the different illustrations of, uh, of the machining domain, where uh, very small surface finishes or even micro feature sizes can be increasingly found. And then there is a whole uh, domain of silicon, uh, you know, machining, which also is borrowed from the microelectronic processing industry, which would be looking at in great details. So, let us look into uh, some uh, briefly into the, the conventional domain uh, of the machining before starting. And so, typically uh, in the conventional domain as uh, we all realize that there is a tool and this tool is used for penetrating a work material uh, to remove certain amount of material up to a depth. Okay? And the amount of depth that the tool goes into the material is also known as the depth of cut. So, uh, there is of course, a relative motion between the tool and the work piece and different geometries can be realized based on this relative motion between the tool and the work piece. For example, look at turning the way it produces cylindrical parts. So, you have a single point cutting tool and there is a, uh, a mass which needs to be machined and it is rotated at a certain rpm and the tool goes and scribes off the material and increasingly goes deeper and deeper into the, uh, the material, so that the circular symmetry of cut can be generated and a cylindrical piece can be generated based on that. Uh, of course, uh, there are shaping and milling, uh, which generates flat surfaces. Uh, then there are uh, drilling processes, where you can produce holes up to any dimensions of different diameters, where again uh, the relative motion between the tool, in this case the tool rotates and the work piece is fed linearly, uh, it determines really how the shape of machining is going to be on the work piece. 
<coughs> so because of this regular uh, scribing of uh, material there is a temperature generated at the machining zone and uh, that is advantageous for high productivity and uh, better finish primarily because uh, uh, there is a slight reduction in the strength and the ductility of the material that you are cutting and uh, the preheating always helps uh, to make the material softer and so you can at a very high yield and better finishing accuracies be able to cut materials. So, uh, there are certain illustrations uh, found in literature for example, uh, a paper by El Caddy et al as you can see here in 1998 which claimed for the first time that formation of a continuous chip from discontinuous uh, ones uh, were due to workpiece heating. And uh, then of course, uh, this Thorn Copley 1997 uh, who actually built a laser assisted prototype to improve the machinability of difficult to cut materials on traditional turning processes by preheating using this laser assisted uh, system. Okay. So, the, it, it was focused uh, the laser beam onto the workpiece just above the machining zone and reduced the cutting forces by quite a bit and improved also the tool performance this way. So, some examples where uh, playing around with the temperature of the material in order to get better finishes or more uh, uh, amount of material removal uh, have already been demonstrated by various people uh, using conventional machining domain. So, if you categorize uh, the, the different metal cutting processes, they can be either uh, categorized into the forming uh, processes or uh, the generation processes and I would like to classify uh, between the two. So, a forming process typically is when a cutting tool uh, possesses uh, the finished contour of the work piece. For example, let us say for example, in this illustration, this tool here is having a inverted contour okay, as can be illustrated here of uh, whatever it produces finally onto the work piece surface. And so, you give it a feed and then also give it a cutting motion and whatever contour is there on the surface of this tool is uh, replicated in negative form onto the surface of the work piece over which this is moving. So, you are forming the shape which was there on the tool, the negative of the shape which was there on the tool over the work piece surface. So, so it is called forming. Okay. A surface may incidentally also be generated for example, let us say this single point cutting tool example in a lathe where there is a, a movement uh, of rotation given to the work piece and the tool is fed in this particular direction and also given a depth of cut. So, that there is a circular symmetry which is developed uh, of the cutting zone resulting in development of a different shape. So, these uh, processes can be thought of as generating the contour or the feature by relative motion of the tool with respect to the work piece. There can be a combination of both the forming and generation processes as can be illustrated in this particular example, which is a slot milling example, where uh, the forming can be thought of as uh, provided by the thickness of this cutter and the milling can be thought of as a relative motion between the tool and the work piece doing the machining operation. So, another uh, process. So, these are all the metal cutting processes and the other processes that I was referring to is uh, based on machining by abrasion. And in abrasion machining, the machining allowance is uh, removed by a multitude of uh, hard angular abrasive particles or grains, uh, which we also know as grits and which may or may not be bonded to form a tool of definite geometry. So, in contrast uh, to the metal cutting processes during abrasive machining, the, the individual cutting edges are randomly oriented and uh, the depth of engagement is small and uh, not equal for all the abrasive grains. And there is an average uh, averaging effect of the cutting depth which results in uh, a sort of surface finish on uh, the, the, uh, the high yield processes. Uh, like some of some of these 
metal cutting processes, forming or generation processes, etc. So, it is really a finish machining operation and not uh, all the abrasive grains are simultaneously able to remove. So, they come in contact one by one and then they remove their own uh, material by brittle fracture and therefore, the averaging effect also becomes more prominent because uh, the, the chips removed are very, very minute and most of them are invisible because uh, the temperature operation is so high that they get oxidized and you can see a flame come out from the such abrasion or such uh, rubbing action of the abrasive. So, let us look at some of uh, the schematics of how abrasion happens. So, typically uh, one very interesting uh, abrasion process is of course, mechanical grinding and, uh, <coughs> and then the, some of the other processes are honing and super finishing processes that employ either a solid grinding wheel or sticks uh, in the in the form of bonded abrasive. So, this is illustrated here in this example where you can see that there is a there is a stick for example, this is the honing process and this is a stick here illustrated by this uh, uh, highlighted region okay, is containing the abrasive grains or the grits adhesively or, or bonded onto the surface by using an adhesive and uh, you apply a low pressure to this honing stick and uh, move this stick with respect to the workpiece. So, there is a gradual finishing of the workpiece surface and you can use as a medium uh, something like oil which carries off uh, the material which is dislodged from the workpiece because of this low pressure of the honing stick. Another uh, interesting example of uh, metal abrasion process is where instead of the adhesive being bonded as was the case earlier with grinding or honing, the adhesives are open and uh, you use a wheel to rub the adhesive which is typically in the slurry. So, this slurry which is around this region really contains uh, the adhesive or abrasive I am sorry, uh, the, the, the slurry contains the abrasive particles. And uh, the, uh, the tool here is nothing but a rubbing agent where it takes uh, the abrasive slurry and rubs against the work piece. And the tool can be rotary in nature as you can see here. And these are used for very soft applications like for example, when really high level of finishing like polishing operations are needed, you can use some of these techniques like lapping or buffing or polishing where loose abrasives uh, are used in a liquid media and the tool as such is nothing but a rubbing agent of these loose abrasive particles. So, that is how abrasive mach machining can be categorized into, into various uh, different domains. Now, let us uh, <coughs> get into the domain of the non-traditional machining processes as uh, we have illustrated so far many times. So, uh, uh, traditional machining of course, is uh, as you know mostly based on removal of materials uh, using tools that are harder than the materials themselves. And uh, increasingly the need for non-traditional is really felt because of the novel materials or alloys or high composite, high strength composites which are being developed by material science. Uh, so, that these techniques can be commensurate. Uh, uh, you know with such novel materials which uh, are increasingly finding engineering applications in even industries. So, <coughs> what are those uh, non-traditional processes or what is the domain of the non-traditional machining? So, we can actually have a closer look by going into this particular illustration or slide. Okay. So, here I have tried to classify some of these non-traditional or advanced manufacturing processes into different domains and uh, there are three principal domains that we can really uh, classify these non-traditional machining processes as there is a mechanical machining domain where uh, you can again use uh, uh, mechanical removal of material as a means of doing machining. Of course, in this particular case as you will see uh, the, the, the material removal will not be in a bulk state as turning or 
grinding processes but in a very super fine state by use of abrasive materials in a very um, uh, interesting manner. Uh, there are thermal ways and means of removing a material for example, what an electric discharge can do or a power of an electric beam can be used for machining or material removal or as a matter of fact power of laser beam or iron beam or plasma beam can be increasingly used for some of these thermal processes. And then of course, there are <coughs> this chemical and electrochemical machining processes where uh, uh, things like lithography or even uh, you know where, where a, uh, the power of a chemical called photo resist to be able to microstructure itself very accurately can be used for going smaller and do micro manufacturing with high surface finish and micro components, micro systems as such so on so forth. Then of course, there is this uh, ECM or uh, electrochemical machining where uh, particularly metallic domain materials in the metallic domain can be easily uh, removed using ECM where complex shapes uh, in the most intricate corners can be machined very easily. And then of course, there is a huge domain of photochemical machining uh, which uh, can be a combination between uh, optics and chemical machining. So, therefore, so the, the, the most of the non-traditional processes are classified only into these three kinds mechanical, thermal and chemical or electrochemical means of removal. And uh, it is not necessary that only one process can be used, you can use hybrid processes where you can have uh, uh, the combination of more than one process. And by the by, uh, this, this classification is really based on how you are applying the energy. So, you can actually have the machining action using uh, mechanical energy or thermal energy or chemical or electrochemical energy and they form the classification basis of uh, this different material removal processes in the non-traditional domain. <coughs> Let us look at these machining processes one by one. So, the first uh, mechanical machining process which comes to our mind is uh, ultrasonic machining or as a matter of fact water jet machining which are typical examples of single action mechanical non-traditional uh, machining processes. So, if you look uh, at the schematically how this uh, happens is that there is a mixture of abrasive grains. Okay. So, this uh, mixture can be made up of a medium, a liquid medium into which these grains are immersed and these grains are all uh, individually capable of moving and free to move and uh, this uh, this grain containing slurry is pressed onto a work piece by means of a tool which vibrates at ultrasonic frequency. So, essentially this tool head which vibrates let us say in this direction in the positive z direction at uh, some uh, above sonic frequency or ultrasonic frequency is able to hit the abrasive grain onto the workpiece surface and thus remove material in the brittle fracture mode. Okay. And so, uh, super finishing processes again sometimes use these USM driven uh, you know material removal mechanism where the feed or the depth of cut or even the, uh, the tool frequency can be adjusted in a manner so that different levels of finishes can be obtained on the surface. For example, Another, another example of a mechanical uh, machining process is uh, what you can do with water jet machining. So, <coughs> essentially here as the name sounds, there is a jet of water which is released at a high pressure and there is uh, uh, you know a forced uh, directed small uh, jet area which is used to cut the work piece. Sometimes, uh, you have uh, abrasives loading this water jet and so you will have uh, these slightly the process slightly modified from WJM to AWJM abrasive water jet machining. So, so therefore, you use an abrasive uh, material to actually perform the cutting action here and, and uh, the jet provides the impact to the abrasive material to cause the brittle fracture. So, the machining uh, <coughs> 
medium in most of these cases are solid grains suspended in cutting fluids and uh, you can actually replace the abrasive grain by ice particles and so that uh, can subsequently uh, be called as ice jet machining. So, all these are mechanical uh, non-traditional processes because uh, the action that is applied here is really brittle fracture based mechanics of removal of uh, the material and therefore mechanical. So, we will look into the details of this process uh, particularly the USM and the abrasive jet machining processes uh, a little bit later. Uh, Let us come to the second modality of uh, material removal which is also known as thermal machining operation. So, here really uh, the modality is thermal in the sense that you are trying to apply heat energy uh, so that it can cause melting or vaporization of the workpiece material thereby removing the material as uh, liquid or vapor state. So, <laughs> there are many secondary phenomena of course, which uh, occur when thermal machining is being considered for example, micro cracking, formation of heat affected zones, uh, striations or banding phenomena which can come during uh, the thermal machining processes if they are not very well controlled. And so, therefore, uh, a, in an important modeling aspect of such processes come into picture which we will look into great details as we go over some of these processes. So, the source of heat could uh, either in this case be that of an electric discharge as you can see here in EDM. So, there is a plasma or a discharge which is created between the work piece and the electrode and the dielectric material inside uh, in between the, the work piece and the electrode acts as an insulator really where the plasma can be created in specific columns. And so, whenever this plasma gets created the electron pressure is able to create a local temperature enhancement. So, thus taking the material the work piece material to wherever this plasma strikes to its melting point and whatever melt is withdrawn is uh, removed by this psi circulating dielectric material. So, this is one form of uh, machining called electro discharge machining. The, the, the power of uh, the, the thermal power can be provided by a plasma beam uh, and that uh, then would be called plasma beam machining or let us say an electron beam. Uh, so, therefore, uh, that can be called as E beam machining or electron beam machining or it can be any other uh, form like an ion beam or a laser beam. And the mechanics of uh, removal of the material here is more or less thermal, but uh, the conversion principles are different. For example, in electrons it is really the kinetic energy exchange between the, the penetrating electron and the lattice uh, of the material, whereas in laser beam machining it is a photon to phonon conversion uh, or uh, the conversion of photons into bond vibrations which results in the machining process. And uh, so, thermal machining also uh, is very in, is increasingly being performed uh, in hybrid machining processes where uh, some of these conventional uh, formulated micro parts are given a secondary treatment using some of these thermal machining processes for uh, issues like uh, um, complex geometries or even good surface finishes etcetera. A third category of processes is the chemical and the electrochemical machining processes as is illustrated here in the electrochemical machining process you again have uh, the an electrode and work piece as another electrode and the electrolyte is flown in between the work piece and the electrode in question. And therefore, uh, there is always a ion transport which happens in between the electrolyte where material is removed from the work piece and the idea is that it should not get deposited onto uh, the electrode, but should get precipitated as soon as it gets removed from the work piece. So, the electrolyte constitution is very critical. So, that it is not only able to create an ion movement from the work piece, but also is able to precipitate the material and move the material if we can circulate the electrolyte around. And so, that is what is meant by electrochemical machining and it is governed by Faraday's principles and you can really calculate and model the electrochemical machining rate uh, based on some of these basic physics principles. 
The other uh, process is uh, chemical or a photochemical uh, machining process where again chemical machine would chemical machining uh, would uh, formulate the domain of etching where etching is really nothing but uh, sort of engraving of uh, metal structure or engraving of a certain area of a metal or uh, any other substrate uh, by by etching it selectively with respect to a chemical so that chemical can cause either a redox reaction on the surface or it can actually uh, make a state of uh, atoms removed from the surface which cannot dissolve very well and it gets increasingly carried away. Uh, it can also be uh, a gas based system where the same etching action is provided by a gas and not a liquid chemical. And so therefore, some of these processes increasingly used in silicon micro machining like PECVD plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition or CVD chemical vapor deposition can be used increasingly to either bulk uh, micro machine or surface micro machine some of these micro systems. Photochemical machining again is a very very wide area of uh, interest as far as the micro systems uh, machining goes and this photochemical machining typically includes uh, uh, a photographic film called resist and this resist is removed uh, selectively with respect to a mask and selective exposure to a certain frequency light. So, therefore, if you can formulate a coat of this resist and selectively uh, remove materials off its surface, then those uh, can result in vias and trenches which can expose the substrate, the parent substrate selectively uh, for chemical machining and other different forms of machining. So, photochemical machining certainly is a very, very, very important area as far as the micro systems uh, fabrication technology goes and we will actually look into the details of some of these uh, systems later. So, um, uh, thus uh, this chemical machining may include the domain of chemical milling, photochemical milling, photochemical blanking, chemical dissolution and uh, uh, the basically such actions are again used to remove the the machining allowance through ions in an agent okay. and electrochemical machining uh, of course uses electrochemical dissolution by the passage of uh, electrons and ions from uh, within the electrolyte and those uh, machining allowances uh, can be removed you know or the, or the or the material can be removed to formulate the machining allowance using an ion transfer mechanism in a electrolytic cell. So, that in a nutshell is what uh, is you know a brief description of what would be in the course content. So, on one hand we are actually going to learn this fabricating of micro systems uh, with an angle of micro manufacturing and on another hand uh, and so this would mostly include silicon based processes or uh, processes where which can be increasingly applied to polymeric systems or glasses okay from a standpoint of micro systems fabrication. And then the other uh, end of the course would actually delve into these advanced uh, machining uh, technologies which have been indicated here that is uh, thermal, mechanical and chemical, electrochemical forms of machinings. And then finally, we would like to integrate number 1 with number 2 okay, so that uh, we can use these advanced machining or non-traditional machining processes for making uh, manufacturing micro systems okay and so this section of the course would be dedicated to mostly uh, some of the advanced uh, research articles which would focus on how mems can be created using non conventional machining technologies and then we would also like to demonstrate practically some of the micro systems fabrication protocols and processes where non traditional machining is actually realized is actually used in practice to formulate a real microsystem. So, that is in a nutshell what this course is intended to be.